anyone who loves American history um, finds it a privilege to be in this building and to be invited to speak here um, is especially gratifying. Shortly before his death in 2007, one of the great historians of the New Deal, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., wrote the following. Conceptions of the past, he noted, are far from stable. They are perennially revised by the urgencies of the present. When new urgencies arise in our own times and lives, the historian's spotlight shifts, probing now into the shadows, throwing into sharp relief things that were always there but that earlier historians had excised from collective memory. New voices ring out of the historical darkness and demand attention. When I began to write this book in a serious way, just after um, I read those words by Professor Schlesinger, I came across some very surprising voices, surprising to me, out of the darkness, as it were, of American history of the 1930s and 1940s. So let me begin just by reporting on or noting three or four of those voices. The first belongs to Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann was arguably the single most important journalist of that time. And he wrote the following in 1939, not in 1933 when President Roosevelt as we heard, famously declared the firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In 1939, Lippmann wrote the following. Three times in these 20 years, the American people have had great hope, and three times they have been greatly disappointed. And the three disappointments that he was referring to in 1939 were, first, the promise that democracy would triumph globally after the First World War. Second, that capitalism, the market economy, would produce enduring prosperity, which it seemed to be doing in the 1920s. And the third disappointment that he noted was the failure of the New Deal to quash fear. That surprised me. It was the same Walter Lippmann who one week after Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated in March 1933, and we used to inaugurate our presidents in March, not January. It was the same Lippmann who had written one week after the inauguration, the nation which had lost confidence in everything and everybody has repaired its confidence in the government and in itself. So what, why disappointment? Um, not many years later, a half dozen years later. And it might be observed that the 1933 Lippmann is the Lippmann most historians remember, or it's the New Deal most historians remember, the New Deal that converted fear to confidence. A second voice. This voice belongs to Senator James Eastland of Mississippi, 1944. The United States, July 1944. The United States um, was at war and um, with more than 10 million soldiers under arms and deciding at that moment in Congress, actually deciding from the period January to July 1944, how, if at all, soldiers could vote. Recall that the election of 1944 took place after D-Day. Uh, we had soldiers um, on the ground in Europe, and sailors on ships throughout the Pacific. How could they vote? The Roosevelt administration proposed that every soldier in the field, that is soldiers who could not get absentee ballots, should be handed a federal ballot. They could fill it in, write the name Dewey, Governor Dewey of New York, or President Roosevelt as their preferred candidate for office. Instead, a bill sponsored by James Eastland of Mississippi 
and John Rankin of Mississippi passed into law. And that bill was justified by Eastland in the following way. These boys, he wrote, are fighting to maintain the rights of the states. These boys are fighting to maintain white supremacy. That's a precise quote stated on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Or hear one more voice, the great writer E.B. White writing to the Herald Tribune in November 1947, a letter to the Tribune in which he began, I live in an age of fear. And the last voice to begin my remarks belongs to Dwight Eisenhower on the day he was inaugurated in January 1953. Science, he noted, seems ready to confer on humankind its final gift, the power to erase human life from this planet. Now these voices, the voices, the kinds of voices that I believe had not been fully attended in New Deal histories, remind us that concerns about fear did not stop in 1933 or 34 or 35 or 36, but fear remained a constant feature of American public life throughout the 1930s and 1940s. And it was that recognition, the multidimensional quality of fear, that led me to write the book Fear Itself. Now, in writing, I thought the only true justification for writing a new book on the New Deal, um, if you were to go to the library and punch in New Deal on um, a computer um, a catalog, thousands of entries would come up. So why write another book? It was those voices that motivated me to write another book, but motivated me also, of those voices motivated me to think about the relationship between fear and democracy in our time when we too live in an age of fear. We confront economic volatility, global religious zealotry, military insecurity. So listening to those somewhat forgotten voices from the past, I decided to write about the 1930s and 1940s to better understand the relationship of democracy and fear. Our time has produced anxieties perhaps not of the same magnitude, but I believe we're being tested in similar ways. So by exploring how the New Deal dealt with such challenges, fear itself probes not just the achievements, but the cost of doing what was necessary to preserve liberal democracy and protect its values. The book investigates fear and democracy by offering four shifts in perspective. The first is quite simple, at least at first glance. I extend what I mean by the New Deal through the Truman administration. After all, Harry Truman was Franklin Roosevelt's last vice president. Most historians of the New Deal stop typically in 1938 or 39. Um, 38 was the year the last major New Deal uh, piece of domestic legislation passed, the Fair Labor Standards Act that gave us a minimum wage and a 40-hour week. 1939, of course, was the year the Second World War began in Europe. Um, and some historians, of course, go as far as 1945, carrying through um, the age of Roosevelt himself. Uh, the great historian David Kennedy does that in his book, Freedom from Fear. But I thought to continue through to the Truman administration, not just because Harry Truman had been part of the Roosevelt uh, era, uh, but because by continuing up until 1952-53, we can see some features of modern reality that might have remained um, somewhat obscure. Two in particular. The first concerns the layering of fear in American life. Now, fear 
is generated by circumstances that go beyond those of ordinary risk. 